I feel, um, this is the Made in Belgium section, I feel a little bit of an imposter, you may detect from my accent. Um, I, I wasn't made in Belgium. Um, but I, I do live and work here, so I think that's how I sneaked into this part of the, uh, uh, of, of the show. But I will do the presentation in three languages. No, I won't. I'm going to do it all in English, just to... Um, Walter, uh, the, right at the beginning of the day, I feel like, you know, you, you, it was great that we had a music, I had a music degree, and we had a, uh, Walter at the beginning um, talking about something which I'd like to talk about. Um, when I felt, when I heard that I was in this slot, it was like a teacher getting their teaching assignment and realizing that their period, end, last period on a Friday. Um, but Walter, at the beginning of the uh, day, was talking about breaking down walls. And my presentation's about uh, breaking down walls between the community and schools. Um, Schools can no longer be isolated bubbles. I like to call them factories of facts. Schools, technology, and community need to converge. TEDx Kids at Brussels brought together some of these amazing TED speakers that you've seen today, and it brought them into our school, St. John's International School. Um, these guys and uh, the men and women, amazing, passionate, curious thinkers. We were honored to have them. And I think they were also honored to have amazing, passionate, curious thinkers in the 10-year-olds that they met as well, because they're our future. These two groups converged together to share and explore. OK, let's talk about the education system that's prevalent in our society at the moment. Our education system is 150 years old. It was started in the Industrial Revolution. We're moving kids around in boxes all day long. We're putting set curriculum down their throats and we're asking them to regurgitate it. We're giving them meaningless tests, which they forget in let alone a month, a year, and definitely later on in life. And we're doing this all day. And sometimes we're sending them home and we're giving them one, two, three hours of homework on top of all that. Let's, let's give kids, if we're going to give them tests, which I think we shouldn't, but more about that later, if we're going to give them tests, let's give them open access to the internet when we give them the tests, and then ask the teachers to design the tests around that. Like they say, if a kid can Google the answer, maybe we're asking the wrong questions. Some teachers see between 100 and 200 students a week. All of the students have a need, they have a learning need and they need to be known and understood. How can we possibly do that when we're teaching 100 to 200 kids a week? But don't blame the teachers. I can't, I have to go back to work uh, um, tomorrow. Um, but teachers are no longer just the givers of information. In fact, I would say that teachers never have, good teachers have never only been givers of information. They're learners, they're passionate. They need to make mistakes and to admit when they make a mistake. They're coaches, guides, mentors, and facilitators. They're social workers, and they do this for the kids because they love kids. W.B. Yeats nearly, well, he, he, in a couple of years' time, will be celebrating his 150th anniversary. So around 100 and something years ago, he said, education is, is filling the pale. It, sorry, education is not filling the pale, but the lighting of a fire and we need to personalize learning. Facts are no longer king. I have a five-year-old daughter, and let me tell you, parenting just got a whole lot easier thanks to Google. No more making things up like my parents, sorry, mum, at the back there, uh, used to. Let me give you an analogy to describe what I mean. The, London, uh, the uh, National Gallery in London has about 2,300 items. If you're going to visit London, I grew up in London, so I was fortunate to have it there. But if you're going to visit London and you want to visit the National Gallery, you couldn't possibly, well, you could, you'd have to be there for days, see all of those items. And so when, next time you go, you might want to um, get a guided tour. And you ask a guide to take you around, say, 30 or 40 of these pictures. As you're looking around and the guide's showing you a picture up there, your eye wanders to the picture next to it because that's, you're curious about that. This one's quite interesting, but you've noticed the one next to it. And you say, I'm very sorry to the guide, because you're very polite. Could you tell me about that picture? 
And the guide says, I'm terribly sorry, but that's not on the tour. It's on another tour. That's what we're doing to kids. We're saying, I'm sorry, you can't learn what you want because it's not on the test. That's the problem. We're feeding them with information and not paying enough attention to their interests. We're teaching to the test, not to the interests of the kids. A few weeks ago, I decided to be a, um, a seventh grader for the, for the day. I do this sometimes. And what I'd like you to do, if you have children, any of you have children uh, in the audience that are at school, contact your principal or your school and ask that you could do this as well. Experience what it's like to go from the beginning of the day to the end of day and the homework like I did. I only had one harrowing experience, and that was at lunchtime during recess. I was out in the playground with them. I wore what I thought, well, I should know because I, I work with them every day, um, wore what I thought 13-year-olds um, uh, wear, and a kid came up to me in the playground and looked at my jeans, in fact, the ones I have on, and said, uh, those are so 20, uh, 2010, and they just walked off. But I went to a great, one of the great lessons was Mr. Robinson, and it was English, and the lesson was called What If? And it was designed to stimulate our ideas for creative writing. So we all had to come up with a what if. So the students talked among them, amongst themselves, and, and towards the, uh, you know, after sort of 10 minutes of that, we had to come up with our what ifs. One of the students said, for example, if you ate an apple and you had superhuman strength, that's a great example of something you might want to do some creative writing on. Another student said, if you could, if, what if you could push a button and everybody froze in the room except you, what would you do? When it came around to me, a student for the day, I said, what if there was a school with no homework, no tests, no grades, and you could learn about what you want? Now, I was expecting, I'm the principal, I was expecting a reaction, and I got a round of applause. But what I wasn't expecting so much was I got comments like, well, you're crazy. I mean, I didn't mind them calling me that because I was one of them. It's a dream. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. They hadn't said it was crazy when the kid said, you eat an apple and you had superhuman strength. And they hadn't said it was crazy when you push a button and freeze time. But a school with no homework, no tests, no grades, and you could learn about what you want seemed ridiculous. Well, the good news, there are schools like that out there. And I'm going to tell you about one system in the States that shows this. I'd like to let you know about a school that was founded by Dennis Litkey and Elliot Washer called Met Schools in the States. There are about 30 of them now. And um, they, they, they talk about big picture learning. It's a school where it focuses on your, on your passion. These are high schools, by the way. Two days a week, the kids go off into the community. And that's what I'm talking about, bringing the community into a school, the kids go into the community and the community coming in. If you're interested in cars, for example, you go off and work in a garage for two days a week, experiencing and learning in that garage. If you're interested in astrophysics, they try to pair you up with an astrophysicist, maybe at the local university or somebody in the community. If you want to invent things, you should join one of the hacker space groups from, from earlier on or something like that. Imagine you'd have those kids in there hacking for two days a week. Then when they come back, they do their projects based on their experiences in the community. These are ninth graders to 12th graders. There's no focusing on grades. There's no tests. Each kid has an advisor, and the advisor has 15 kids. 15 kids. Now, that's personalized learning. That advisor knows each kid, knows the families, knows the kid's passion. I spoke to a teacher recently that said she had taught a kid for four years and didn't realize that the kid's passion was astronomy. The big picture schools, the big picture, uh, the Met schools, for 16 years have served 26,000 students. They're in demographic groups least likely to complete high school. 85% of them receive Title I funding. 66% are eligible for free meals. But the statistics are staggering. 97% attendance rates at these schools above 97%. 98% to 100% get college acceptance. 
and reading, writing, and math skill, uh, scores are, are above state average. So that shows if this works, then why aren't all governments, states, and educational authorities doing something like this, personalizing learning for the kids? Let me give you an example of personalized learning. A parent whose kid goes into, from kindergarten into first grade. And this parent was worried at first because the kid was going into first grade for the first time. And every day she would come home and she would talk about what she'd been doing at school and she was excited, she wanted to go in the next day. This was great for the parent, as you can imagine. But after four, five, six weeks, she kept talking about the same thing. All we're doing is we're talking about rabbits and pets and animals. So the parents called the school, went into the principal, I know what that's like, and they were concerned. If not, they were ready to complain. Five or six weeks and no math. The principal explained what they'd actually been doing. And they'd been getting together the animals, they'd been talking about their animals in first grade, their pets, things they were interested in. They'd been putting them into groups. Um, they were collating the information, they were surveying the whole school, they were analyzing the information, and they were making graphs. They'd been doing maths the whole time, but the kid hadn't realized it. And that's what I mean by personalized education. Learning should relate to their world, not the real world that we decide for them. It needs to focus on curiosity. They need to have a chance to explore deeply, not in 50-minute blocks, but they need to be able to explore deeply. They need to be able to, based on their exploration, take action. And most importantly, they need to be able to make mistakes. Too much of our education system doesn't encourage making mistakes. There's a lot of talk in education at the moment about the importance of technology in schools. Technology is vital, but it's much more than that. We need to converge school, technology, and community into one. I believe that schools need to be like that, not in the future, but right now. During TEDx Kids, one of the things, that, that the ways I'd like to um, illustrate this is the media room. We had our, our, our speakers came in, they did the workshops with the kids, and we, had a med we set up a, a, one of the classrooms as a media room. We had the sixth grade media team working on that. They were analyzing, blogging, interviewing, tweeting. We had the professional uh, production team doing the editing, but we had high school students doing the cameras. We had a grade seven team working on cartooning, documenting the day. And we had the TED speakers in that room as well, the experts interacting with the kids and getting on with their things and talking to the kids. This, for me, sums up what we're trying to do. It was a hive of activity. You wouldn't have known you were, going, you were in a school as we know schools to be. Curiosity, exploration, and action converged. Community, technology, and school as one. At the end of TEDx Kids, the kids, they reflected on their uh, day. And one girl said she'd it'd been inspired. We were, they were asked them what, what would inspire them the most that day. She said she'd been inspired to find a cure for cancer. What if? Thank you very much.